guitarist. <laughs> oh, that's uh, fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good day from wherever you are. Welcome to another edition of the Digital Download, which is soon to be globally syndicated, longest yeah, running funny. weekly business talk show on LinkedIn Live. Live. Yeah, <laughs> there nice. we go. Today, we're going to talk about the silver dollar secret to crafting unforgettable messages. We have a special guest, Robert Matson, to help us navigate the discussion. The founder of Intrigue, a consultancy dedicated to refining and enhancing business messaging, Robert has decades of experience in honing the art and science of storytelling for maximum impact. But before we bring Robert on, let's do some brief introductions. I say brief because it looks like well, it's I've, Adam and I today. You know, I've, I've just literally put a, a, a comment in Slack saying, you know, where is everybody? Because obviously uh, it's an hour earlier for me than it normally would be. Oh, that's and right. I'd, I'd completely forgotten about it. And it's only because I've got my notifications uh, uh, configured. So it pings me with 10 minutes to go. I was like, oh, my God, I've forgotten about that. So uh, I'm here by chance rather than by design, my friend. Ah, uh, well, I'm glad you're here at all. Um, I, I completely forgot this is the, the week that you've um, moved the clocks back and we haven't yet. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I know Tim said that he will try to join us later. I would presume the rest of them maybe just missed the the time change. Yeah, they're, they're still in bed, mate. It's only one o'clock. <laughs> uh, well, with that, Adam, please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm, uh, as you can see, Adam Gray uh, from DLA Ignite. I'm co-founder and uh, we... Uh, effectively a training and change management company we help organizations use social media to have more conversations with the people that they want to talk to um, i must say that, that it's it seems like an incredibly exciting time at the moment it seems like for the first time ever in my life i'm talking and people are listening you know i seem to be having the right thing to say to them which makes a nice well i say you know in the business world clearly it's very different at home i'm i talk and i'm <laughs> completely ignored you know as is as is the norm Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And myself, I'm Rob Durant, founder of Flywheel Results, a proud DLA Ignite partner, and we help startups scale. Uh, so, as I said, this week on the digital download, we'll speak with Robert Matson, from startups in their early stages to established enterprise clients. Robert stresses to each of them the importance of crafting compelling messages. He believes that it's not just about stating what you do, but illuminating how you change the world. Robert, good morning and welcome. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Adam. It's great to be here on the pocket edition of the digital download. <laughs> the <laughs> pocket edition. Fantastic. Uh, so, Robert, let's start by having you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you got here. Uh, well, it's a, it's an interesting path. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail because I'm old and it would take a while. But uh, when it comes to finding your goal and your mission in life, uh, you know, some people are born entrepreneurs. Some people have entrepreneurship thrust upon them. Uh, I spent my life starting in engineering and working my way to marketing. And my last corporate gig was as a VP of marketing at a software company that uh, was a small company. And I had been there for about eight months and I finished someone else's half year and I was two, mu two months into my first year and we had a few soft sales quarters. And when you're a small software company, uh, you have to make tough decisions and it's very easy to go from strategic leader to overpriced overhead. And uh, the CEO, who's a dear friend of mine and I actually I talked to very, very recently, just said, hey, I, I, I can't keep you. So I was out and oddly enough, I got a call from his wife saying my sister needed some help with coaching a person at her company on presentation skills. And I've been doing that my entire career. When I join companies, they find out uh, I'm an actor, I'm a voiceover artist, I'm a playwright, 
I do, I'm a singer songwriter. I do a whole bunch of stuff. And the minute they find that out, they're like, can you write a script? Can you coach these people? I'm like, sure, I can do that. But I went and I, it turned from one person coaching to 25 people, two different sessions in Philadelphia. And I had these people do an, an, a start presentation to see where they were. And this one gentleman named Christopher, he started in about five minutes into his eight minute presentation. He goes, I have to stop now. I'm like, okay, that's fine. And we went through the workshop. And I came back a week later after they, got, they did the workshop, they got all their feedback. And Christopher came in and did a 10-minute talk without a single slide uh, about creativity. And he told the story about Tom Waits and the woman who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. And at the end of it, I wanted to hug him. I said, Christopher, what happened? That could have been a keynote. And he looked at me and he said, you showed me I didn't have to be afraid anymore. And I went, okay, I found my calling. And since then, I have done everything from help people set up their home offices for, uh, for Zoom calls during COVID to uh, work with people, do keynotes, help people with their core messaging, work with salespeople on how to integrate storytelling around their core messaging. And it's been a heck of a lot of fun. Awesome. Wow. Uh, so I want to get to the silver dollar. But before that, I have a few questions leading up to it. Sure. Uh, first, why should business messaging evolve as an organization matures? You had shared a little bit about that with me before. I thought that would be great for you to share with our audience. Sure. One of the challenges that I face, uh, and I get calls and I talk to executives every now and again, and I'll get a call and they say, we really need help telling our story better. I go, no, you don't. You need help telling a bunch of stories better that are actually your customer stories, your prospect stories, analyst stories, whomever your audience is. It's not your story. It's a story that they will identify with. And it's not one story. It's think of it as a shelf of stories. And as you develop as an organization, you have different audiences. You're in different places. You have different messaging. And your stories have to change because you're trying to get people over hurdles. It's not just teaching one thing. It's changing their thinking where they are and who they are at the moment. If you think of the sales process, first it's, should I even listen to you? What value do you have to me? Then should I put my reputation on the line and call a meeting? Then are you worth the budget to go to my CFO? And maybe how do you compete against all the people that look like you? So it's all these different messages that need to come up and they constantly evolve and they constantly change. So storytelling isn't a one and done. It's kind of a way of life. Uh, could, could I just quickly, a, a slight yes. change of subject. Um, it appears that, that as is often the case, we, we have a, a messages not coming through issue. So uh, I just wanted to say that Andrew Slesser has just said, good morning, Robert. Uh, so hi, Andrew, thanks for joining us. I'm sorry we can't put your comments on the screen. Again. <laughs> Well, you can feel free to be the verbal scribe and the voice of the people, Adam, if you wish. It, it's the role that I've, I was born for, my friend. There we go. I know that there's some sort of setting I'm supposed to toggle because that's so easy to do in the middle of a live show. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you for that, Robert. Um, you mentioned the sales process. And I know when we talked, you told me that you believe the sales process is flawed. Let's let's explore that a little bit. Tell me what you mean by that. Uh, well, I have a little bit of a visual trick in my bag, if I may. Please. Excellent. Okay. So the reason I tell people the sales process is flawed is because most salespeople I've worked with have the same process. So they have a client. They ask great discovery questions. Robert, just so you know, we're getting the mirror image. Ah, I cannot write backwards. Yeah, so if you if you go to the little cog at the bottom of your screen and Let's click on that, that uh, and then if you go to video, you should be able to click mirror camera, which should reverse you. And there we go. Perfect. Ex Excellent. So they and great because this questions. is broadcast on radio as well, if you can describe what you're drawing absolutely to the best of your ability that all be right so i've started i'm going to be drawing a triangle and the first leg of the triangle is goes from client 
to pain. So salespeople are trying to find the pain. They ask great questions. They find the pain. And then what do they do? They align that pain, which is the next leg of the triangle going down, to find their position. And then they go back and they do their demo or their pitch. And that's the last leg of the triangle. So it goes from client to pain to position. The trouble is, what does your competitor do? Well, the competitor starts at the same point, asks very similar discovery questions. I'm drawing a red line right next to the black line of the triangle. Then they align to their solution, and then they do their demo and pitch. So you're actually showing things through kind of a lens of pain. All the features and functions that you're showing as a salesperson are exactly the same ones or feel that way to the, to the, uh, to the prospect of the client. So the challenge is that people are looking for differentiation, but they're using the exact same process, which is limiting all the goodness. So the thing is, you don't just have to be different. You have to sound different. And by being different as an individual, telling stories, being more intriguing, that actually gives you a little bit of an edge on your competitors when you're selling. So the sales process, it's broken because everyone uses the same one and it makes everyone look and sound the same. But aren't we? Oh, we are far from the same. Let's put it this way. Uh, if Adam told the story and you told the story and I told the story based upon the same concept. So if I say you've got, I want you to tell a story about a boat, a child and a deserted island. Now, in my story, it might be a child in a storm being stranded on a deserted island. For your story, it might be a child who is playing with a boat in his bathtub and the foam is the deserted island. And for Adam, it might be the child is actually a pirate in a speedboat and is leaving the deserted island to plunder, uh, to plunder the Spanish main. We had the same starting point, but we have three entirely different stories. And the one that you tell makes you sound different and people can identify it. And the better the storyteller you are and the more you can relate it to the world of the people that you're talking to, the more it's going to resonate. In fact, if I tell you a fact, you get a 5% chance of remembering it in a day or two. If I tell you a story, you have a 70% chance of remembering it. So okay. stories are the way we are wired to remember stuff. And then the story itself you were giving me some key insights there if i'm the salesperson who is the the star of that story this is a big change for, yeah this is a big change for a lot of people regardless of what the story is hey how's good to see you sir hey sorry i'm late yeah, that's <laughs> daylight saving what can i say right <laughs> <laughs> Well, Alex, long time watcher, first time fan, first time guest. So I'm thrilled to meet you. Welcome. Uh, <laughs> and same to you. Yeah, uh, you. So the key to any story is that the person you're telling to identifies with the hero. So if you're telling a personal story, they should identify with you. If I'm telling the story of the 1977 Star Wars A New Hope uh, Part 4, they should identify with Luke Skywalker. So whatever story you're telling, they have to feel a connection with it. And what do most people, most salespeople do when they're telling a story? They make themselves the hero. They make themselves, their product or their company, the hero. Uh, I see a lot of client stories and there are good ones and bad ones. Uh, I'm actually doing a talk later on today for a client about this exact topic. And I, I'm showing an example of a bad client story, which is basically a client name with a few numbers, their brochure, and then some stats at the, at the bottom. It's basically a brochure disguised as a client story. It should be about the journey of the client, the challenges they faced, uh, and how they overcame it. And the product or the company is just the catalyst of change. But the is so uh my experience of being on the receiving end of this stuff is that uh 
the the concept of who am I going to make the hero of my story is way, way, way more sophisticated. So, you know, these stories are still being told like, we've got a ship like called the Millennium Vulcan. It can do uh, the Kessel run faster than anything else. This is how fast it is. It's got guns at the top and the bottom, and it's got loads of storage space, and people used to smuggle in it, so you can hide people in there as well if you want to. And it can land just about anywhere, uh, and it's really stealthy. And it's like... Okay, that's that's given me no insights whatsoever into why I should watch the film, although it has factually been correct. And I think that a, a lot of the challenge is that, um, I, I think you spoke with us once before about the power of storytelling, is that that's a message that still, it, conceptually it may well have landed with people, but actually, uh, 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 tactically, you know, how can I tell that story? What What is a story? Uh, is still a million miles away from where most people are. You're absolutely right. Uh, think of the difference between uh, reading a car spec sheet about its engine and horsepower and taking a test drive. Yeah. You know, and, you and, and I think we, nowhere do we see that more than on, uh, on people's LinkedIn profile. You know, so they they have an almost limitless amount of space to tell their story. When I was a little boy, I was going to be an astronaut and I decided I was going to do this. And when I started in this role, I thought I've arrived. And then I learned that I wasn't very good at this and I was really naturally good at this. And this bit really worried me. And I had a great manager and it, that's a good story to tell. But instead, what they do is they say, these are my responsibilities. This is what I achieved. These are the awards I got. And then they do that for each role. So, you know, it's like saying, uh, sell me that sell me this cake well it's got flour it's got sugar it's got eggs it's got butter uh it's got jam you know that could be that could be anything from a croissant to a sponge cake but but no one no one knows yeah it's things like that when you like even just telling the story about how you made it and the background mm. is is far more interesting than what's in it <laughs> And, but I think what's really interesting about this whole and, and you know, storytelling, I completely concur, Robert, it, it is the most crucial part of getting your message, A, so that it's consumed and B, so that it's remembered once it is consumed. Um, but people are still, generally speaking, either afraid of it or they can't conceptualise the thing that they want to say into a coherent narrative so that it has a beginning and a middle and an end and 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 in fairness to them it's not because they're stupid it's because they've not done it before and yeah. because that's not how generally how your world works unless you're a copywriter or something telling stories is not what you do it's actually what you do is you deal in facts you should buy this product because it'll provide a seven to one roi well that that's very nice mm. that, that hasn't helped me move towards wanting this thing you said something there. I, I, I wanted to pick up on it. You said, sell me this cake, and, and you listed off the ingredients. Robert, I'm going to put you on the spot. Sell me this cake <laughs> in the form of a story. Okay. In the first, all right, so there's a process. And now discovery questions are not bad. So the first thing I'm going to ask you, so Rob, you're the person buying the cake, fair? You put yes. me on the spot, I'll put you on the spot. Fair enough. Deal. Okay. Uh, Rob, may I ask you, uh, what is the event that you're buying the cake for? Oh, it's um, my mom's 75th birthday. Oh, fantastic. Is the whole family going to be there? Oh, the extended family. Absolutely. Okay. And so it's going to be a fairly good size cake? Yes, please. We, Excellent. We're looking to feed at least 30. All right. So I'm going to step out of character right now. So I've now asked some basic discovery questions so I can understand. Uh, and the final one I'm going to ask is, Rob, what's your mother's favorite color? Uh, probably red. Red. Excellent. So, Rob, when it comes to the cake, it's not really about the cake. It's about the moment where you bring the cake in. So when you bring I that cake in. I just want to add uh, um, Andrew's comment on screen before we go too far. <laughs> it doesn't take much for me to buy a cake. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Andrew. He's already bought it. Uh, yeah, we're I'm, all I'm on the same happy. page there. <laughs> all right. Sorry about that. Not a, not a worry. So uh, it, the cake that you buy is going to be dependent upon the people and all that type of stuff. But the moment where you walk in and give that cake to your mother, you want to make sure it's the right cake because she's only going to have one seventy fifth birthday. Mm 
especially surrounded by her entire family. So the thing is, not only do we want to make sure the cake is big enough. I'm, by the way, I'm doing a nice subtle upsell right now. The cake is big enough. So not only can everyone in the room, all of the people that are around to enjoy your mother's 75th birthday. Uh, what's your mother's name, by the way? Maureen. So when Maureen sees the cake, we want her to see her favorite color. We want her to see a cake big enough to feed her entire family. And also, we'd like to have leftover cake so people can relive that moment when they take they eat that piece of cake the next day with their lunch. And they could carry the story of Maureen's 75th birthday and share it with their extended family that either couldn't make it or maybe even just the people they know. Because we want a Maureen's birthday to live on through this cake as long as it can. And we want to give her a special day as we could. Nice. That, that's and, amazing. And I'll take the upsell, the bigger size, and you can yeah. even sell me the containers to put the leftovers in so that everyone goes home with a piece. Yeah, you, you, you've, you've elevated a simple cake baking exercise into this, this kind of uh, this thing of almost mythical status now, haven't you? Well, the thing is, there's, when I talk to people about stories, and I hear a lot, I'll work with salespeople, and they'll say, I'm not going to tell a story to a CEO. And I'll say, hmm, really? You think that CEO didn't get yelled at for not cleaning their room or had a problem finding a prom date? We're all human beings. You're not selling to a company. You're selling to a person. That's why I needed to know about Maureen's age, whether the family is going to be around. I needed that background information to know what are the emotional triggers that I can hit that will make this cake feel more important. When it comes down to it, if you can make the person feel, 95% of decisions in the buying world are made in the unconscious mind. That's according to Dr. Gerald Zaltman of Harvard in his book, How, Co the, uh, How Customers Think. So 95% unconscious emotional, 5% logical and non-emotional. But what do we do? We focus on logic and emotion and features and functions. If you can trigger the emotional part, when it comes down to it, people are just end up thinking, which one feels right to me? What was his name again, Dr. Gerald? Gerald Zaltman, How Customers Think. Or, I'm sorry, the mind of the customer. You talk no, I'm sorry, about how customers think. I'm looking at it right there. The mind <laughs> of the customer is a different book. How customers think. Yeah. You talk about selling to the CEO, and I, I thought Jan Compton's. Uh, did I get it right this time, Adam? Jan. Yayan. Yayan. Thank you. Yayan Compton. Which, which apparently comment. apparently is Welsh for John. All right. So from here on out, it's John. <laughs> <laughs> Yian Compton's comment. Uh, is that true, Adam? Don't we all tell stories with every conversation with friends? I suspect we only stop telling stories because we're trying to be corporate. Well, well so often that's the case, isn't it? That, that you know, we're all able to build uh, increasing, increasing closeness of connection and relationship with people. The more we share with them, the more we empathize with them, the more we get to know them. And uh, and somehow we we forget that when we move into a work environment, you know, so that, as, as you all know, you know, when you're talking to somebody in a professional capacity and you say to them, you need to share some stuff about you because that's the thing that will, will make you approachable. And if you're approachable, more people will approach you. It's not called approachable for nothing. Um, and they go, yeah, but, but no one wants to hear about me. They want to hear about the product. I go, no, absolutely they want to hear about you because they're forming the relationship not with, pick, you know, insert CRM vendor of choice here, uh, not with the company. They're forming the relationship with you. You're their guide for buying this. You're the person that they're going to phone up if there's a problem or there's an issue or if they've got bad news or good news to share with you, not the company. But still, they don't get it. Sorry, Robert. No, I'm just, I, I love that. But I, there's something I, that I talk to people about a lot. And especially when I work with speakers, the people that are doing like keynotes and stuff like that. Mm. And I tell them all, I said, don't credential yourself. Don't go in and say how long you've been working, what, what your great achievements are. No one cares. Yeah, let, let me just tell you a little bit. Let's enough about you. Let me tell you a little bit about myself and how I got here. Yeah. Yeah. It's, what a great way to empty the room. Exactly. <laughs> now that doesn't mean that a personal story can't mm. be used. The question is, does it have a meaning to your audience? 
Are you bringing them value as quickly as possible? I tell people the key three words to be a great communicator, selfish, lazy, and smug. Assume your audience is a little bit of each. They're selfish. They want what they want. They want value out of you as quickly as they can get it. And your history is not it. You can weave your history into your stories, though. And that will get let them know you on the fly. They are lazy. They don't want, they don't want to do a lot of math. Don't put up a slide saying, I know it's a bit of an eye chart. Th th why are you saying pick my own adventure versus lead me through a narrative? And they're smug, especially in sales. Because in sales, people, they're being You can't sold. teach me anything. You can't teach me. <laughs> you don't know my business. You think I'm a wallet with legs. <laughs> and I tell people, I tell salespeople, I'm like, you know why salespeople don't tend to have sales in their title? Because no one wants to be sold to. So you're no longer a salesperson. You're an industry analyst with a quota. <laughs> you're here to share knowledge and to give them the benefit of your experience. Show them that and they will welcome you in their doors. Try to sell them and they won't, they'll ghost you on a call. So yeah. those are my, my three keys. Sorry, I get a little passionate Love about it. this. <laughs> Absolutely. Love it. Adam, you were saying that uh, most salespeople, um, uh, what was it? Um, that they, they park. They, uh, they uh, want to yeah. give the, the facts and figures yeah. because people don't want because to hear stories about it. Yeah, they're not interesting yeah. enough. That's the Andrew answer. Lester's comment says, any salesperson really wants to get from point A to point B in the quickest way possible, but the actual way to get to the from both points is in the details. Sure. I contend even further that it's safer in the details. I can tell you all the facts and figures about my product that I'm representing, and I don't have to expose my personal life to the situation. I don't have to share because it's safer. Robert, you're nodding and smiling. Oh, yeah. But, uh, but I think that Andrew's point there about, you know, getting from A to B. So A is me and B is you. You know, I need to, to take this offer to you as quickly as, you know, to, to cover the distance as quickly as I possibly can. Surely the quickest way to cover the difference, the distance between us as quickly as I can is if I walk towards you and you walk towards me. And the question is, how do we get someone to walk towards someone else? Well, if, why, why am I going to take your call, Robert? Because I like you. That's a really good starting point. If I like you, I'm going to A, listen when you speak and B, believe you when you say something. It's pretty straightforward, really, isn't it? And what, and what Adam just did was an element of storytelling. He used a metaphor of walking towards each other to illustrate the point, which made it visual. Even though you're just using words, you made a visual in my brain, which actually pushed you down through the neocortex into the limbic system and down to the amygdala. So I had to evaluate that, which made it A, more interesting, B, more memorable, and C, you forced my brain to do something. It was, it only took about three seconds. Yeah, I, I love that. There's a word, there's a word in the English dictionary that describes what you, that, that is, means what you just or is what you just described there, Robert? And I can't remember it. Well, there are Does a lot anyone... of words in the English dictionary. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and, and I know four of them. <laughs> <laughs> that is what you just described there, Robert. It's when a word creates something visual or a series of words that create something visual in your mind. I bet there's a German word that's about that long that means that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, if someone in the audience knows that word, please, please uh, remind us. Um, Rob, there's um, I think we may have an issue with the comments again today because I just noticed yes. Donna Kunde has uh, made a comment on your LinkedIn post about this. It's not coming through, but if you'd read it off, that would be appreciated. Happy to. No, no, so no, Donna no. says. I thought, I thought I was the person reading these things off. Oh, well, <laughs> no, 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 go on. Get Sorry, Alex. <laughs> Go for it. No, I can't, um, I can't see it. That was a joke. <laughs> I was telling a story. Do Donna says, uh, what I'm hearing, the client buys you, in co inverted commas, first on the human level, and then you bring them on a journey that benefits them. So she's kind of just saying, this is what I'm yeah. hearing. 
Would you agree, so disagree? It, to an extent. It doesn't need to be. They don't need to buy you particularly. If you are doing your job really well and you're using these elements, they can still be focused on their problem. What they are really buying is how you make their life better. It's not you. It's not your product. It's the change you can make in their, their life and experience. That's what they should be buying. Now, if they like you, to, to Adam's point, it makes it easier. And if you're a skilled storyteller and a skilled salesperson, or and by the way, we're all selling, whether it's a product, your opinion, your viewpoints, we're, we're constantly trying to convince people of things. So they shouldn't hate you. Hopefully they like you, but hopefully they're seeing how what you do or what you bring to the table can improve the, their lot in life. And if you do that, they'll usually lean your way. Yeah. Rob Turrell asks, is the emotional connection sales or marketing? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> but so storytelling is uh, storytelling is not a sales or marketing. Storytelling is everyone in the company. Everyone in the company should be able to share standard stories versions of the standard stories that they've customized in themselves, their own stories. So when I deal with salespeople, I, I say there tend to be two major flavors of salespeople. There are robots and there are cowboys. Now, I'm making extremes to, to illustrate a point. Robots will take exactly what you give them and they'll recite exactly what you've given them. Cowboys will throw everything out and do what they want. Now, what I like to say the perfect salesperson is like a jazz musician. It's someone who knows the melody, can riff off the melody, and not screw up the rest of the band. So that, so when it comes to storytelling, you're all jazz musicians. You all know the major themes that you want to support, but you're adding your own flavor to them. And it depends on not only you, but who you're talking to and where they are at the moment and what hurdle you're trying to get them over. Yeah. So it's everybody, guys. We all should be telling stories, our own and others. And, you know, this conversation is great, but what's the best way, you know, for someone that values storytelling, has done it well in the past, but has equally done it badly in the past, knows that I do need to get better at storytelling. What's the, what are the thing, where should I look? What should I do, Robert? Other than talk to you. You're trying to force me to do a plug for myself and I won't do it. So here's how <laughs> you do it. Go on, do it. You've been green green lighted for this. Oh. Yeah, you, you'll get my contact information. You can talk to me, follow me on LinkedIn. I post a lot of stuff. But no, here's how, here's study storytelling. Storytelling is everywhere. There are structures in storytelling. Uh, I tend to go with a simple three act structure. Intro, conflict, resolution. So that is a structure. Study storytelling story in all its aspects. Go to a moth night, a storytelling night. Take, uh, take a class at your adult education on movies and film. There, there are more books in storytelling than there are, I think, storytellers. They're all over the place. <laughs> so just study the concepts of storytelling. But the key in business is how and when to use storytelling for purpose. If you go in and just tell a story about your kid's soccer camp and at the beginning of a sales call, and then it doesn't relate to anything, then yeah, maybe they connected with you at a personal level, but they're like, why did you waste my time with the story? Yeah. But if that you was the robot to... not kind of picking up on, on the, the details, the nuance. Uh, so I'm sorry, Rob, can you repeat that? Cause I think, uh, <laughs> the, that was the robot not picking up on the nuance. Oh, Robert told me tell stories. I'm going to tell a story. Uh, I told a story. It didn't go anywhere, but Robert didn't say make it go anywhere. Well, it did, <laughs> but I just didn't hear that part. So it's Robert's fault, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah right. Most things are, really, when it's in the <laughs> grand scheme of things. Uh, so I think but, you've been leading up to this, but let me ask you what do you mean by illuminating how one changes the world? Okay, so let's see, let's talk about what, Adam, so you talk to people about social media and you get them to have better conversations on social media, right? So that's what you do. This is a, a structure I, I, I talked to about, is 
does means why. What it is, is social media conversations. What it does is it drives better conversations on social media. What it means is that you will make better connections. The why is, okay, what does that mean to them? Better conversations for those people means you're going to make your number. If you're trying to drive revenue, you're going to increase your brand. You're going to uh, improve people's own personal branding. Uh, you know, those are all kind of the, the things that end up happening because you do all the right things. So when I, I went to an event and I asked this woman, it's HR technology. I spent most of my career in that. And I'm walking around talking to vendors. And I say, what do you do? And this very intelligent woman gave me a two minute talk on exactly what they did. And I had no idea what they did at the end of two minutes. I spent 20 years of my life in HR technology. I had no clue. And I asked her the simple question, how do you change my life? She immediately went into a client story about a woman, an elderly woman that they, that had a great experience because of their product. And I told her, I said, your second, your second answer was to my first question. Because as soon as she got to the real example of the effects she has on the world, I went, I get you. And if you really believe in that, if you're not just selling to sell, if you're selling because you want to make the world a better place, not only do I believe in you, believe in you, I want, I want to know you. I want you to be part of my circle because you are the type of person that I want to be connected with. Is that the kind of thing you can prepare in advance, though? Absolutely. Absolutely. Without hesitation. But, you know, it, it, you had to ask her about what you asked her to, to get her to tell that story. If I, if I have that story in my back pocket, do I sound scripted? Can I give you an example, one that you actually titled this session after? Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad you did. So let, let me cue, tee it up if you don't mind. Will do. Robert, what is the silver dollar secret? Well, so I actually prefer, I'm going to change that a little bit because I, this is the real life. People ask me, what do you do? Now I can go in and give them is and does, right? I'm a consultant that does yada, yada, yada. But instead I do this. So Rob, if I gave you this dollar bill at eight o'clock on a Monday morning, you take it, you put it in your pocket. You might spend it, but if you didn't and you looked in your pocket at the end of the day and saw a bunch of dollars, would you know which one I gave you? Probably not. No idea. This is an Eisenhower silver dollar. If I gave you this at 8 o'clock on a Monday morning, you take it, you put it in your pocket, you probably wouldn't spend it. In fact, you might show someone and say, hey, when was the last time you saw one of these? It's like, oh, it's been forever. Where'd you get that? This guy Robert gave it to me. Why did he give you a silver dollar? Well, he's telling me about the power of storytelling. And at the end of the day, if you looked in your pocket and you saw a bunch of dollars, do you know which one I gave you? One dollar, one dollar, same value. But because this is packaged differently, not only does it affect you differently, you pass along my message to others. And every time you look at this, you think of me and our conversation. I help people find their silver dollars. And then when I meet someone face to face, I give them the silver dollar and I say, keep that. And I've never asked anyone, do you still have your silver dollar and had them say no. So you're quite, you're quite good at storytelling, aren't you? It turns out. <laughs> I've done it a few times, but <laughs> I've done, I've given away um, hundreds of dollars in silver dollars. And by the way, they cost a dollar 65 per on eBay because you can't get them from a bank. Uh, <laughs> so by the way, I could do that with you, but if I did that with Alex or Adam, because their currency is different, it wouldn't resonate with them. Now, Rob, you probably were given a silver dollar as a kid. Yeah. So I know it's going to resonate with you. So I have to know my audience to know the right story to pull out of my back pocket. Now, I believe in that story. I really believe in what it means. So I have no problem with sharing it. Oh. How about that for a testimonial? Read it for us, Adam, because I'm going to butcher his name again. Yian Compton says, and I think we all agree with this, what a brilliant guest Robert is. A great, really interesting, stimulating broadcast. And then clappy hands. Yeah. Oh, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> no, no more, no more, no, no more, no more. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you can, have, you can have a story you know really, really well. But if you believe in it, 
and you believe because I'm not telling a story. I'm trying to I'm trying to get you to understand something, and I'm passionate about wanting you to understand it. If you are th- are authentic, it doesn't matter how rehearsed you are, because the authenticity is always fresh and new. Yeah. Uh, Rob Turrell says uh, the silver dollar, like Jack Charlton story as an Irish manager who signed for a team meal with a check. The restaurant owner framed the check and never cashed it. <laughs> yeah. See, people, people named Robert are naturally great storytellers. Now we have. Proof. I would agree. <laughs> but let's talk to the robot seller that's now on eBay trying to find silver dollars. <laughs> that's not necessarily going to work for them, is it? No. What do they have to do to make it their own? Adam, it's radio. <laughs> no, <Nope>, nobody. <laughs> Thank you, Robert Gray. I appreciate that. Uh, you've been promoted to Robert Hood. Uh, so it's understanding the structure of storytelling and then filling it up. You can buy the bucket and you can learn how to use the bucket. It's what you put in the bucket that's important. And so understanding the three-act structure, open with something interesting, have something that's persuasive, and end with something that you want them to remember. Because people tend to remember things at the beginning and the end of conversations. Um. <laughs> yeah. Andrew says, this is why this is the longest-running business show on LinkedIn. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so you, But learning how stories are structured and then looking at examples and then finding one that works for you and think, who is my audience? How am I trying to get them to see my value? How I can help them, how I can change their world. And then don't make it about yourself, make it about them. So have you got um, a, a simple guide for this? Because w- one of the things that I encounter is that um, when I'm talking to people about what they need to do, they understand this stuff at a, at a, a, a conceptual level. You know, the, the, the example that I often give is, is, you know, you read your brand guidelines and it says, we are professional but friendly. And someone reads that and they go, yeah, I get this. You know, I get what professional is, I get what friendly is. That's easy. But when you have to turn that concept, which is quite abstract, into something concrete, it's really difficult. So go on then, write me a professional but friendly email. And people don't even know where to begin. And I think with storytelling, you know, they look at Indiana Jones or they look at Beverly Hills Cop or they look at, you know, whatever the great film is that they grew up with. And they go, I know that story inside out. You know, Cop goes to Beverly Hills to sort out uh, uh, the death of his friend. And, he, you know, he ends up uncovering this conspiracy, which he ultimately solves and befriends the people there. You know, so it's a really great story. Everybody gets it. The story is really simple. So now you t- tell me your story and people, I'm sure, say, oh, I haven't got anything to say. And so, so, so what is what is your kind of template that people can? And, and, and actually, before I ask the question, I think one of the reasons, one of the, the things that hampers people from doing this is that they're scared. You know, if I tell if I tell your story and somebody hates it, I don't care because it's your story, not mine. If I tell my story and somebody hates it, well, what they're actually hating me, not my story. So that it carries with it a lot of perceived risk. So, so what is the simple framework that they can put their narrative into so that they can dip their toe in the water of storytelling and then they can have a go? And then obviously when they get good feedback on it, they go, oh, brilliant, I'll try a bit more of that. So what's that first kind of <sighs> moment? So there, there are structures that can be used. The three-act structure is one of them. Uh, just anyone look up three-act structure. Then look up a TED Talk and say, okay, I'm looking for the three-act structure in these examples. Because I can show you the structure and I can give you examples, but it's really the habit of creating stories that you have to create, that you have to start building for yourself. So you know you need a beginning, a middle, and an end. You know it has to resonate with the people you're talking to, that they see themselves as the hero of it. And it has to have a purpose where at the end they learn something. So to me, that is the key elements. Uh, When I, I mean, I teach a two day workshop 
and even at the end of a two day workshop, people are just beginning the storytelling journey. Yeah. Because they have to get in and start doing it. But the element to me, I was doing a workshop and we're at the end of the second day and I had the head of sales in the back of the room and he called me over and he said, I'm watching them differently because he had, he had actually thought of, he had figured out the structures and what he was looking for. So the minute you start watching them differently and listening differently, then you can start building your own. So to me, it's learn the structures, the science, the purpose. Don't try to build your own yet. Try to dissect other people's. It's kind of like being a songwriter. You, you know, it's, you know, A, B, you know, a course, B course, bridge, C, maybe C course. You, you know the structure, and then you start listening to songs differently. It's like, oh, they didn't do they didn't do a bridge. Why is that? And you start figuring it out. So to me, it's learn as much as you can about it, start listening to stories, and then start to make your own. Yeah. I, I think that's a, a I think that's really good help for people. And I guess that when when people start looking, what they do is they see they see stories everywhere, but more importantly, they see that the things that they like are stories, not facts. And, you know, one of the things that I find really interesting is that everybody knows that when they place a, an ad to recruit somebody, they get a load of CVs through and mm -hmm. they read the first one and they half read the second one and they skim the third one and then they just kind of... Do, do I like this person's name or have they included a photo? And do I think that uh, I want that person in the office with me? You know, and and they they kind of percolate down to the most banal reasons for choosing somebody because they don't invest that because they get really bored. And yet there are films that, that we watch or books that we read that we, we do that read them over or watch them over and over and over again because the story is so gripping and we remember every detail. And for many people, I guess it's about connecting these dots. You know, if it's powerful, it will have this effect. If it's pointless and vacuous, it will have no effect. And you need to be very clear about where you're pointing your efforts. So the funny thing is when you mention resumes, I occasionally do some resume rewrites for people, mostly for friends, because it's not my business. But they've come to me and said, how do I tell my story better? And I say, your resume is not your job history. Your resume is your marketing sheet <laughs> because managers do not want to hire another person. They want to solve a problem. And because trust me, I've been a manager a lot of times in my career. I never wanted to hire another person. I didn't want to manage another human being. I just wanted to solve things. Mm -hmm. And if the easiest th way to solve it is hire a person, that's what I ended up doing. So think of your resume, think of your mission statement as your opening paragraph of your book. Don't, and by the way, eliminate all the industry leading, proven, all the marketing BS words. Say, I like to do this. And this is the type of place I want to be. And this is what gets me up in the morning. Because people have a, a recruiter spends about six seconds scanning a resume. A, make it look different. Don't be afraid of color. Two, make your opening paragraph something. And three, highlight the things you want people to see. So that's the kind of core advice. I actually, when some layoffs hit, I put out, a, I said, I will do five resumes, reviews. I'll spend five hours with five people. And 13 people signed up and I ended up doing 13 of them. <laughs> but we, I basically shared those concepts and they seemed to help people. People told me they helped, so. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. But storytelling so is Robert, part of everyday life. As we're uh, getting closer to the end, I know we talked a little bit about this, so it's a two-part question. Uh, the first part is, what's the wrong way to end a presentation? <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way a lot of people end presentations, right? So they end it with, are there any questions? And if they're in sales, and what are our next steps? I mentioned that people tend to remember the closings of things. Nearly 100%, the studies show. So the reason I tell people don't end with questions, you can do questions and do them near the end, perfectly fine. But the last thing you want to end with is something that you decide. Because if you say, are there any questions, and someone asks you a question that you either can't answer or answer poorly, 
they're going to remember, oh, this person didn't have their stuff together. So if you answer the questions, and even if you go, we'll get back to you on that. Oh, one last thing I would like to, I would like to, uh, to mention. And you end with a closing statement and what I refer to as a benediction. If you spend time with people, you have given them service. You have earned their attention, hopefully. Now you want to ask them to take what they've learned and maybe pass it along. Basically, ask them to change the world. Go forth and take the knowledge that you've g- gathered here and give it to other people. Make a difference. Do something. You've earned the right to ask for a little favor. So end with a benediction because you've got the opportunity. Well, your, uh, your idea about um, you know t- tacking something else on the end, I mean, the best example of that is Steve Jobs, isn't it? You know, so he would do the product launches and he'd walk off the station and go, oh, just one more thing. And it would be the reveal of the iPhone or the iPad or the G5 or whatever it was. And that was the thing that got the standing ovation. He was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he could have gone quite a long way. <clears throat> could have had potential, yeah, definitely. <laughs> So I don't know if you recall, but you shared with me two possible things that you would leave an audience with at the end of the presentation. Uh, I'm trying to remember exactly. There's so many examples. I'm trying to remember two different things. Uh, so I like to leave them with just something, something memorable is uh, what I like to leave them with. The silver dollar is something memorable. Uh, I like to leave something physically in the room if I'm doing something live. If I'm doing a small group, I want to leave something that after I leave is there. Because if you do an hour talk, you don't want to win the hour. You want to win it five minutes after you leave the room. So it's that type of concept. I love drawing things on the wall. And by the way, for all anyone looking for a job, get on the whiteboard if it's in the room as quickly as you can. Change it from an interview to a working session. That way, they're in, they are actually working with you and they're envisioning you as someone they're working with. It gives you the edge. So you're trying to drive memory. So it's a phrase, it's a physical object, it's an image. Any of those things. Uh, there was a, do I, do I have time, Rob, for just a, a, a quick All the time you want. Example? Excellent. I was doing a workshop and there's a gentleman by the name of David Law. He was the last person in the workshop doing the closed story. Now, David, the, the tech, they sold the technology and he knew that their edge was, they had a great implementation process, watertight, left no stone unturned. Now he wanted their audience not to know their implementation process, but to value that it was important. So what he used to do was show them the implementation process, but he was making them do the math. Remember, selfish, lazy, and smug. Don't make them do the math. So instead he came up with a very simple story. Now, David was a guy about my age, a little older, I think. So, you know, a, a gentleman of presence and vintage. And uh, he told this story. When I was 17 years old, I was learning how to fly a plane, a small single engine plane at a really tiny airport. So small, in fact, that about 100 yards off the end of the runway, pine trees started to grow up, 80 to 100 feet. So one thing flight instructors really pushed you on was weighing the plane, figuring out the horsepower, making sure you had enough lift to get over those pine trees. One day when I wasn't there, I heard a plane had clipped its landing gear on the pine trees and had to turn around. Now, no one was injured, but they turned around, they couldn't make their run. And I was really curious about that. And I went to my flight instructor, said, what happened? He goes, well, they were too heavy. I go, yeah, I know that, but didn't they do the pre-flight check and weigh the plane and do the math? He goes, well, yeah, they did, but they were carrying Christmas trees. Okay. What is it? Didn't they weigh the plane with the Christmas trees? He goes, yeah, but what they didn't know was that if Christmas trees are traveling over a certain distance before the plane gets takes off, they're watered. And he looked at the room and he said, do you really want to be a plane full of Christmas trees? And that became the lingua franca, the shorthand for a badly thought out process where someone in the room said, we can't be a plane full of Christmas trees. That is the type of verbal silver dollar that you can leave with people that they'll remember and it can actually become part of their culture 
So those are the things you want to leave, the things that carry your message and enable that message to be passed on. Because if they remember your story for, th for three days to a week versus forgetting a fact after a day, what do they do? They're talking to other people in the organization. They're spreading that because they remember it. You are enabling your message to blue. Love it. Brilliant. Uh, Robert, so brilliant. how can people follow up with you? How can they get in touch with you? Uh, well, obviously, love LinkedIn, love connecting with people. Uh, I, I try to post uh, as often as I can. Uh, it's a little tougher now. I'm a little bit busier these days. Uh, but I've got literally hundreds of posts. I've got videos on there. You can look up some of my old stuff. Uh, intrigue.cc. So pretty easy to remember. Uh, it's, it's Intrigue Communications and Coaching. And .cc is actually the Koa Islands. So I stole their domain. <laughs> so it's intrigue.cc if you want to do that. And you can email me, Robert at intrigue.cc. Love to chat or DM me. Awesome. Story and everything. Do what I get. Right. <laughs> Wanted to thank you for a fantastic conversation. Wanted to thank the audience for some great questions and great insights. Of course, to the panel, thank you very much. Um, if you are interested in being a part of the digital download, uh, we would love to have you on the show if you have something to say visit us at digitaldownload.live under Be Our Guest, or there's a QR code on screen right now, brings you right to the guest application form. Again, Robert, Adam, Alex, and to our audience, thank you very much for another fantastic episode. This has been the Digital Download, which is... The longest running weekly business talk show on LinkedIn Live shortly to be syndicated globally on internet radio. There we go. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. And thank you all. Well done, Robert. Great. Thank you. It's been an honor. We'll see thank you all you, next week. Thanks, Robert. Bye-bye.